Good morning and welcome to Pleasant Grove Baptist Church to our online service. I uh, appreciate you watching and joining in with us as, as we've gathered here in person. I want to encourage you to, uh, wherever you may be watching, to engage, to get your Bibles ready, to pray and ask God's Spirit to speak to you, to teach you, to help you understand what it is that we're going to be uh, reading and going through today. This morning, we're continuing our new series as we look to break down Micah 6, 8, a very famous passage for a lot of us, and really focusing in on the question that uh, is posed here is, what does the Lord require? And so I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab your Bibles, open to Micah chapter 6, and also go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2 and stick your ribbon there or a bookmark because we're going to be spending some time in that uh, chapter as well. Let me pray for us and then we will dive into this together. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word, the power that it has in our hearts and in our lives. And, and Father, help us to just not read it, but to study it, to apply it, to really abide in it. Help us to see that it is living and active. Help us to understand that these are your words spoken to us and they are still as relevant today as they were when they were written. We love you and we thank you for Jesus and we ask that your spirit teach us this morning. Help us to draw near to you as we ask ourselves that question, what does the Lord require? What do you require of us? And it's in your name we pray. Amen. As I have uh, grown in my faith or matured spiritually, one of the things that I have started noticing is that God never asks us to do something that he doesn't provide what it is that we need to do that specific thing. Whatever the case may be, God is not going to ask us to do something that he will not provide all that we need for it whether it be evangelism. He's not going to lay on our hearts the need and urgency to share him with others and abandon us to that. No, he will provide what we need. He will provide the opportunities. He will provide the words. He will provide all that we need to be faithful in what he asks with discipling, with being uh, faithful to his word, whatever it may be. God gives us what we need. And so as we look at Micah 6, and we're reminded, as we looked at last week, that one of the main issues that Micah was trying to address here was the problem of people performing, the problem of people speaking a certain way, acting a certain way, when all God was really wanting was their hearts. You see, we can act, we can talk, we can go to church, we can perform, but it's meaningless if God doesn't have our heart. And so Micah is asking the people of Israel and Judah, he said, mankind, he has already told you what is good. And so what does he require of you? And so we look at these three aspects and we're going to start looking at the first thing today, and that is to act justly. The word used here is the Hebrew word mishpat, and it is found over 400 times in the Old Testament. And the Bible speaks on two types of justice, two kinds of justices. And the first one is the justice with the intention of retribution. And what that means is that you're trying to punish someone who is in the wrong, punish any wrong doing. But the second in which this verse is specifically referencing is justice with the intention of uh, restoration. And I love how one uh, author wrote, he said, giving those, talk, speaking of restorative justice, he said, giving those who cannot stand up for themselves, the victims, the poor, the powerless, the vulnerable, the voiceless, their due as well. And so what God is asking and requiring of us is that we focus on restorative justice, that for us to act justly means that we are seeking the restoration of other people. Stephen Um in his um, commentary on the book of Micah wrote, it is more than only punishing wrong. It is creating a situation and a society where everything is right. 
a society where every last person in it, including the most vulnerable and the weakest, can flourish and thrive. That's what doing justice according to the Bible really means. So I want to share a couple of passages of scripture before we dive in to this a little further. Proverbs 31, 8 through 9 reads, Speak up for those who have no voice, for the justice of all who are dispossessed. Speak up, judge righteously, and defend the cause of the oppressed and the needy. Psalm 82, 3, provide justice for the needy and the fatherless. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 3, this is what the Lord says. Administer justice and righteousness. Rescue the victim of robbery from his oppressor. Don't exploit or brutalize the resident alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Don't shed innocent blood in this place. Psalm 146, verses 5 through 9 reads, Happy is the one whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects resident aliens and helps the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. And so those are just a handful of passages found in the Old Testament that deal with this theme of justice and the, the wide umbrella that it casts over manhood and how we live and mankind and how we live our life and what it is we are to do to help. But Jesus also addresses this issue, this issue specifically while addressing the hypocrisy found in the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Again, these Pharisees were trying to perform. They were uh, more focused on giving of their tithe so that they wouldn't have to deal with the needy, to deal with the issue of justice, to deal with living out their faith. They were performing rather than pleasing God. And so when we get to this uh, passage in Micah 6, 8, Michael writes, mankind, he has told each of you what is good. And so what he's implying here is that the people already knew. The people already knew what it is that God required of them. And if you remember verses uh, 6 and 7, they put on this elaborate display of well, what should I offer you? What is it that you require? What can I do to make you happy to keep you off of me? Should I offer this year old calf? Should I bring thousands of rams and 10,000 streams of oil? Or maybe I can even sacrifice my own child. Then Micah responds, you already know. He has already told you what is good and what the Lord requires of you. And the first thing he lists is to act justly. How do we act justly? How do we do justice, which some other translations read? Before we move further, we need to be reminded that as Christians, we are already recipients of God's justice. Therefore, we must be dispensers of justice. We've already received it. We've already encountered and experienced that restorative justice. And therefore, we should seek to help others experience the same. God being just means that he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. God being merciful and loving means that he allowed our sin to be punished, but through Jesus and not through ourselves. The author of the uh, Christ Exposition Commentary wrote, If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you've already been the recipient of God's justice, which was satisfied by the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus. You have been declared not guilty for your sin, and you have received the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. In an unjust world, God commands us to be dispensers of justice to those around us. Jesus suffered in our place, and since we live in an unjust world where we are surrounded by people who are suffering, 
people who are being oppressed, people who are going without, people who are being mistreated. What we are to do is to act justly by helping them find restoration in Christ. Now, there's a, a misunderstanding that the social justice aspect of Christianity is um, leaning away from the gospel of Jesus. And that is completely false because they go hand in hand together. And we'll see that a little bit more clear here shortly. But obviously, if this was important enough to be included in Scripture, then it should be important enough for us to include in our own lives. And so we are to act justly. We are to seek the well-being of others. We are to seek to help restore those who are broken, who are needy, those who are being oppressed. And I want to share with you two ways that we do that. And this is where we're going to flip over to the book of Philippians chapter two. But the first, it's got to, we've got to change our attitude. We've got to change our attitude. And by changing our attitude, what I mean is that we need to begin or to continue to see others the way that God does. Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Notice he said, In our image. This is God, according to our likeness, the Trinity. God is speaking and with uh, talking about the Trinity, the God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It says, they will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. And it goes on to say, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. So we need to begin to see people as image bearers of God. We need to begin to see people the way that God sees as male and female created in the likeness and in the image of God. We were created in the image of God to be in a relationship with God and with others. We are relational beings and how we view others will always determine how we treat them. So let's look at Philippians chapter two. I'm gonna read verses one through 11. It says, if then is there if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. In verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Verse six, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what Paul is encouraging the people at Philippi is the same as he is encouraging us to, to do as well. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, Sorry, the light just cut out. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. So changing the way we view others, we probably need to begin by changing the way we view ourselves. You've heard the saying to humility is not thinking of yourself less, but it's thinking less of yourself. I think I got that backwards, sorry. It's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less often. And so we need to shift the focus away from ourselves and put it on those, on others, especially those who are in need. And so we are to adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who did not consider his equality with God something to be exploited, but he humbled himself. And we need to begin to humble ourselves as well. Second thing is we need to change our actions. 
to act justly means that we are acting, we are being obedient, we are putting forth effort, and we can't justly, can't act justly without actions following our words. An article in the ministry magazine said, what do these words to act justly mean? First of all, we are asked to act, not merely to preach or to write articles or to read books or to dialogue, have seminars, but to act. Theory must be put into practice. Acting justly thus presupposes intention. It often demands courage and the willingness to stick your neck out. It means that we refuse easy solutions, avoid procrastination, and not wait until every obstacle is out of the way before we act. Act justly. And this comes and it begins and the foundation of our actions must be obedience to God's word. How are we to act? We act in the way that God's word tells us to act, which means that we need to know what God's word says. I want to continue reading in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, there's the word obeyed, so now not only in my presence but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing, but even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you in the same way you should also be glad and rejoice with me. And so Paul speaks on obedience and living out that obedience. In fact, he says to shine like stars through that obedience. And he gives the phrase to work out your own salvation. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody with this phrase, but Paul is not saying to work to earn your salvation. But what Paul is saying is that we need to live out our faith, that we need to live it correctly, that we need to carry it out correctly, or in a simpler way to put it is to take God's word serious, to begin to apply what it tells us to apply. Greg Laurie said on this passage that we need to work out what God has already worked in. And so if God has changed our heart, that should show outwardly as we live our lives. A changed heart will always result in changed actions. And that's why God says, I want your heart before I want your actions. He wants to do the changing so that the change that takes place is God glorifying and accurate as to what he has already done in us. So we need to ask and pray for God to change our minds, to change how we view people, that to change how we view ourselves, and to follow that by allowing our actions to show that as well. To treat people with kindness, to treat people tenderly, to treat people with love and respect, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they look like, regardless of what color their skin is or what they can do for us, regardless if they're Democrat or Republican, we are to act justly, seeking the restoration of others because we have been restored through the gospel of Jesus. Ephesians 4 verse 32 says, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Jesus says in John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. The great commandment, Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, which is just as important, is to love your neighbor as yourself. So to act justly really means that we are to love God and love people according to his word. Be obedient in loving God. Be obedient in loving others so that they can see the love of God in us. Act justly so that people can see that we have a just God who loves them, 
who punished their sins through Christ and offers them forgiveness and restoration. We represent God. We represent his love, his mercy, his grace. And we represent his justice. And Paul reminds us that in Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, as he writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. I want to encourage you to ask God to help you see where you fall in this uh, method of acting justly. Where's your heart when it comes to other people? Do you have a hard time forgiving? Are you holding on to grudges? Are you judging which prevents you from ministering? The idea of justice is that God has already offered it, that we have already received it as followers of Christ, and therefore we are to be dispensers of it. We are to live our lives in such a way through our attitude and through our actions that we give other people an opportunity to be restored through the love of Jesus. So what does the Lord require of us? First, he requires us to act justly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the power that it has, the, uh, the life that it gives, the joy that it brings. And Father, help us to live that out. Help us to change the way we view people because our hearts have been changed by you. Help us to change how we treat people because our hearts have been changed by you. And so, God, what we really need is for you to change our hearts because a changed heart leads to changed thoughts and changed actions. Father, help us to see others as more important than we see ourselves. Help us to not think less of ourselves, but to think of ourselves less often so that we can see the needs that are around us. Help us to love as you loved. Help us to serve as you served. And Father, help us to point others to you. You have told us what is good. You have told us what you require of us and help us to be faithful to that. We love you and it's in your name we pray, amen. If we can help you with any of this, if, we, uh, if you know of somebody maybe that uh, we can reach out to and help as a church, we would love to do that. We want to be the hands and feet of Jesus as we are here in Conway and uh, representing God and also representing Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. And so what we, whatever we can do, we want to do. We thank you again for joining us this morning. We hope you're doing well, staying healthy. We miss you. We love you. And we hope to see you very soon. Take care.